Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 132 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. I'm your host, Paul Marquis, and today we are going to be talking about bicep tendon injuries with Dr. Jessica Aronowitz, who was with us in our last episode and did an awesome job talking about rotator cuff tears and repairs and everything about uh, rotator cuffs. Today we'll be talking about the anatomy of the biceps, proximal and distal tears. We'll be talking about um, the function of the biceps, talking about some surgical intervention, who needs it, who doesn't need it, who needs it quickly, who doesn't need it so quickly, and so much more. But if you just hold for a moment, we're going to hear a word from our sponsors. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome, Dr. Ronowitz. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, thank you for having me, Paul. So today we're going to talk about the biceps a little bit, and I know we were chomping at the bit to talk about it during rotator cuff repairs and, and rotator cuff tears because they are so closely associated uh, in regards to the, the shoulder. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about you know the proximal end of the biceps, the distal end, and um, let's start with some anatomy. What, what do we need to be looking at here when we are talking about the biceps? What makes the, the long head so much different than the short head and, and, and distal to uh, proximal? Okay, so um, that's, a, that's a great question to start out with. Um, the biceps, bi means two. So we all know that we have the, the biceps muscle belly in our arm. As we go north toward the shoulder, the short head of the biceps is very thick and inserts outside of the shoulder on a bone called the coracoid. So it's an extra articular structure the, and it's, it's very wide and, and strong and is actually the, the stronger part of the two when we're discussing the proximal attachment. The long head of the biceps goes up toward the shoulder through the intertubercular groove and then courses medially. It kind of takes a little bit of a sharp turn as it goes through the rotator interval, which is an area between the upper border of the subscapularis and the leading edge of the supraspinatus. And then it goes intraarticularly and inserts at the superior portion of the glenoid uh, called the superglenoid tubercle, tubercle, where it then becomes part of the, the superior labrum. So they're, they're very different structures. And you know, at, at the time of surgery, when we do a shoulder arthroscopy uh, and the bicep tendon is present, it is very easily identifiable. The short head of the biceps I see during open shoulder procedures, but never during an arthroscopic procedure. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that part of that long head of the biceps goes through the capsule and becomes intraarticular because when I see a patient after they've had an injection, I always make sure I find out where that injection was, if it was intraarticular versus extraarticular, so we can identify which structures could be involved. Um, and to me, an injection uh, is very diagnostic, whereas to the patient, it's, it can be very curative. But if they have an injection and it's intraarticular and, and they really get no relief from that, it tells me a little something. Thing. It tells me that we're probably dealing with an extra articular aspect of the biceps and or another part of the rotator cuff. Um, and so I'm glad that you mentioned that it's not just extra or intra articular. Right, exactly. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the function of the biceps. Um, you know, it, some, some people say if you, you can open up a dozen books, half of them will say that the biceps is a major elbow flexor and others will say it's a primary <laughs> forearm stabilizer. I'd like to get your take on it, which you think is primary. Right. So I think, I, I think that it is, um, a, 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 it is a supinator, especially when we talk about the distal bicep. So overall, I think it's a supinator and then an elbow flexor. I think it's also a pain generator in the shoulder. And I think that there's been a lot of question and studies more recently about the function of the long head of the biceps. And I know we'll get into the pathology and treatment of this, but in terms of it being a humeral head depressor, I think in certain, in certain situations that is true, maybe in our throwing athletes and things like that, where it is much more of a critical structure, but a lot of, a lot of, People think that it's more of a vestigial structure now. And in terms of, I mean, if you, you know, if you see any gross anatomy of the rotator cuff versus the, the biceps tendon, the biceps tendon is so much thinner that I, I, I really don't necessarily believe that in the vast majority of my patients, it is actually serving as a depressor or some sort of support structure. It just, to me, it, based on what I've seen, it doesn't, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I think in certain, again, in certain populations it does. So I would say supinator, flexor, um, and then thereafter would be stabilizer. 
Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the distal biceps where it inserts and, um, you know, it, it, are there two heads to the distal uh, insertion of the biceps or just one? Yes. So, so unlike, so the proximal biceps, there are very clearly, they, they literally head in two separate paths. Um, and they are many centimeters apart. Distally, the insertion is much, it, it, there are two separate heads, but it's much more confluent. And it inserts on the radial tuberosity, um, and it's a very thin but stout insertion. And because it is a single insertion there, um, we treat those injuries and ruptures a lot differently than we do of a, of a proximal tear involving the long head of the biceps. Um, so the anatomy is quite variable when you compare the proximal anatomy and the distal anatomy. There's been some attention about the two heads. I think that most of us distally fix it as one structure with, with good results supporting that treatment. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, now, while we're on the, the topic of anatomy, I'd just like to throw in there that the biceps is innervated by C5 and C6. And I think this is very important, especially for people who are evaluating patients who don't have a real specific mechanism, but they might complain of anterior shoulder pain. They might have elbow flexion weakness. They might have weakness into supination. Um, and just recently, I had a patient who um, was lifting something and it really wasn't the shoulder. He had no immediate pain in the shoulder until the next day, started to have some neck pain, shoulder pain that lasted about a week, week and a half. And, um, and it just progressively got worse and he just progressively got weaker. And it was suspected that he had a biceps and or rotator cuff injury. But when we took a look at him, he ended up having a C5 nerve root compression causing um, the same type of presentation, this loss, this real weak um, bicep, uh, you know, elbow flexion and real weak supination. And so I think we need to keep that in the back of our minds when we see somebody who comes in with maybe some painless weakness or they didn't have any bruising or, um, you know, uh, any mechanism of injury. And one of the other things I want to talk about is bruising after a long head bicep rupture. I find it very, very rare that people who tear their rotator cuffs have bruising in the shoulder. So when I see bruising in the anterior aspect of the arm, I'm always suspicious of a biceps rupture and or a fracture. Uh, would you agree with that, Dr. Ronowitz? Yes, yeah, definitely. I agree um, about the, the comments about the rotator cuff. And then, yes, for some reason, they, there is some bruising um, and that tends to go along the anterior portion of the arm, maybe a little bit medially. And then certainly with distal biceps ruptures, some bruising right on the, the medial part of the proximal forearm is, is actually one of the classic findings associated with that injury. And I think you're absolutely right between, between discerning between that and a fracture and, and typically by history and then maybe other components of the physical exam, um, you'd be able to distinguish between those two and then certainly an x-ray would be the final component of that evaluation. Yeah, yeah, great. And the other thing I like to mention at, the, at this stage here is that when I'm trying to identify if a person has, let's say, a bicep tendonitis versus a rotator cuff tendonitis, I mean, we do all the special tests and whatnot, but when it comes to palpating, the important thing is finding the groove, um, the, the, the bicipital groove, palpating that see if there's tenderness there. The rotator cuff insertion is not too far off from there. So a lot of people mix the two of them up. And oftentimes they are both inflamed. They're both irritated. You kind of treat them the same way. But when I when I feel like it's not a rotator cuff and just a biceps issue, I'll palpate down the biceps and they'll continue to have pain closer toward that muscular tendinous junction, um, typically with people with a biceps tendinitis. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, um, you know, anatomically, those structures are adjacent when we talk about the, the biceps and then the, the anterior part of the supraspinatus, but palpating down the groove and, and, you know, if you can't palpate their groove, if they're a bigger patient, that can be very hard. Um, but I think that biceps pain certainly tends to be more anterior, whereas cuff pain tends to be more lateral. But again, as you mentioned, and I completely agree, a lot of times, more often than not, it can be a combination of both. And so it is, it is hard to, to distinguish the two clinically. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that the long head of the biceps attaches to the supraglenoid tubercle, but also has an attachment to the labrum. Now, um, talk to me about why you would do a tenotomy, let's say, or maybe a, a tenodesis on somebody who has a labral injury 
And it, we, we, it seems like we're seeing that a lot more now. I, I, you know, way back when, when I first started treating patients, which was probably by the time you were born, um, <laughs> I, I, we didn't see that. They were, they were fixing slap tears yes. and, and labral tears and leaving that bicep there. Tell me why that's, right. that, that's shifting and, and changing now. Yeah, so this is something that has shifted even over my, you know, my career where I think they, they did a study of the people that were submitting their cases for board certification. This is, say, a decade ago now. And doing a slap repair was actually one of the most common, along with a partial meniscectomy, one of the most common procedures on board applicants. And now it is, it is definitely not. And I, I think that it's fallen out of favor in certain, so in, in certain patient populations, but the, the, the answer is that it has fallen out of favor because we're seeing a lot of um, patients do poorly after that operation when the indications weren't exactly correct. Um, primarily ongoing pain and stiffness. And then when people went back in and they did a tenotomy or a tenodesis and got rid of the intraarticular portion of the biceps, the patients did very well. Um, and so the indications for performing a formal slap repair have really narrowed. And I, I would say that in my practice, and certainly someone that is over 40, um, and, or certainly over 45, over 40, with a sort of a degenerative slap tear, the, the literature and, 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 and my results would support performing a biceps tendon operation instead of a formal slap repair. That is a lot different than a college athlete, a throwing athlete, someone in their 20s, someone who has a labral tear with instability that extends into the superior labrum. So there, these are different pathologies, and I know we could probably do a whole podcast on just labral tear. So we, but the, 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 the bottom line is that um, what people found was that the tenotomy or tenodesis was the revision operation for a failed slap repair and patients were doing very well so then people just started doing that as the index operation and people were doing really well so you know that's my procedure of choice and again in the right patient population and typically this is a, a degenerative labral tear that's found in conjunction with maybe rotator cuff pathology or or, or you know something like that um, and so i do treat that with a biceps tendon procedure Instead, and I think the major risks that that we found is, is stiffness is the is the major risk of, of doing a slap repair in um, in perhaps the incorrect patient, and then continued pain. And a lot of times they can have pain into their biceps, uh, and and, and that, that's definitely treated very nicely with a biceps tendon procedure. Yeah, and in regards to the rehab of these, they, they, they just have so much less pain. They get their function back faster. Um, yeah. And really, they, they do well with these. I, I've been totally impressed, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, which is, is nice for the patient, nice for us also. And we can really get people back, uh, back on track a lot faster. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between why you would do a tenotomy versus a tenodesis versus a <laughs> subpectoral uh, repair? hair or you know a fixation there and if you could elaborate on the subpectoral fix we that's yep. something that we're you know in the, in the rehab world we're seeing a lot more of that coming through can you tell us why you would do that why you do one over uh, the other um please okay so i think the first you know the first decision is whether something with the biceps has to be done and so that's you know in conjunction with pain along the biceps if there's biceps tendon pathology noted at the time of surgery preoperative symptoms so there's a number of reasons to address the biceps so once we've decided to address the biceps the decision is whether to do a tenotomy which is just releasing the tendon at its insertion and not reattaching it or, and I will tell you that there are certain surgeons that will only do one of that. They only do tenotomies or they only do tenodesis. Um, I, I do both um, and both with a, actually a fair, a fair number of frequency and I tailor it to the patient. And I think one, one, major, one major thing with this, and if you look at any studies and literature and people talking about it, if, you know, again, if there's all these studies showing something there tends to be variable results. And so um, people have had a hard time proving if one is better than the other in terms of both of them. So one issue is, is cosmesis. So with a tenotomy, um, there is a higher chance of having some sort of bulge-like deformity. And there are times that that bothers 
a patient. Um, if it does, that's a reason to do a, a, a tenodesis. And there are some studies that show that there is slightly better function with a tenodesis. There are some studies that show that there is no difference. So the, the literature is really across the board. I think in my active, skinnier, muscular patients, I favor a tenodesis. But in older, more sedentary patients, patients that are um, you know, obese and things like that, I, I think a tenotomy is a perfectly acceptable operation. Um, and so I, I tailor to the patient. I talk to them about both, and we make, the, make an informed decision together. Um, and so that's, that's that part of the decision. And then in terms of where to do the tenodesis, there are so many options. And I, you know, I have um, a nice slide on this if, if we ever get to, to do a talk on this, but you can do it at the top of the groove, arthroscopically, at the bottom of the groove, arthroscopically, or a subpectoral biceps tenodesis. Um, my go-to tenodesis is a subpec operation, and I do that for a number of reasons. One, um, it really gets the whole biceps out of the groove, and, and if we believe that it can be a pain generator in the groove, then by, by getting it out of the groove um, and anchoring it right at the right underneath the insertion of the pec tendon, uh, you, you therefore eliminate any future pain generators. And, and so I, I do like that technique. It's also a very reproducible technique. And not only that, but I'm able to, I see the whole tendon. So there was a study done in the arthroscopy journal where if you look at the, you see in, which is what most of us who are proficient at shoulder arthroscopy do, you see about double that, but you're still not seeing all of it. And so some of that pathology can really extend down distally and you're really only seeing that and, and addressing that with, with a sub pack. Um, but that being said, that there are times where if, if I have to do, if I do a tenodesis because of a slap tear or um, because of I issues in, in regards to the rotator cuff repair, I do an arthroscopic tenodesis where I put it right at the top of the groove. Um, and so there, there's a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of different ways. And just like there are preferences with any surgeries, when you talk to a bunch of different surgeons, it, it, a lot of it is just surgeon specific and what their comfort level is. Um, but I, I do think the, the sub pick is a nice technique for the reasons I've mentioned. And it, it involves just a little, I do it with a, basically a two centimeter incision right in the axilla. It tends to heal up very well and patients have been quite happy, quite happy with that operation. Yeah. Great. Now, can we migrate distally a little bit? Let's talk a little about the distal biceps. Um, and can you tell me about the population of people you most often see this in? I'm sure you see way more of these than I do. Uh, and what is the most common mechanism of injury when people, um, you know, when people tear their distal biceps? Right. So this is the way I was trained. And I believe this, this is one of those over the phone diagnoses. So um, I would say 99% fall into this category. So there's, there, are, there are outliers, but it, it most often is men. I'd say between 30 and 60 years old, and they are lifting something. So I, I've had more now recently that have had it because of a fall, but the, the majority, they're lifting something. They're moving their dishwasher out, or they're moving a couch, or lifting a mattress. They're lifting their snowmobile to get it on the trailer, and they feel a pop. Um, and they notice something right away. Something doesn't feel right. And, and that is the classic history for, for a distal biceps tendon rupture. Out of all of the ones I have fixed, I've seen one in, in a woman. Um, so that's, I mean, probably one or two percent, which is a reflection of the literature as well. Um, and they typically present with um, a sensation of it not feeling right. They have a deformity. Now the, the muscle contracts proximally now because it's been the distal biceps that's torn. And I will tell you that after the first day or two, pain is not the first thing that comes to mind. They don't say, oh, this hurts so much. It's that it, it, it doesn't feel quite right. They can't, they don't have the grip strength and the lifting and it doesn't, it just doesn't feel right is what they most often tell me. But based on the history, and then I have one or two quick physical exam maneuvers that have very high sensitivity at, 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 at detecting this, um, and, and then, you know, an MRI can be added in as a diagnostic tool, but it really is one of those classic histories. It's almost, you know, kind of analogous to an ACL type injury that you just, you know, it before you see it, you know, it when you hear about it. 
Yeah. So, so t- tell me, what is your favorite test, your favorite special test for this? Yeah. Can you explain it for the listeners? Um, now, some of, some of the people will be watching this on YouTube, but some will be just listening to this. So if you could give a description, that'd be great. Right. So the, the go-to test that was actually developed um, and, and described by my mentor, Dr. Sean O'Driscoll at the Mayo Clinic, is called the hook test. And so this is after I examine them and, and take a look at their skin, this is the next thing I do. And I always start with the other side. So I just, it, it, it's nice to just start with the uninvolved side to feel an intact tendon. I have the patient look, look at their hand. So I'm standing up in front of the patient and I have them look at their hand. And you can do this on yourself. If you take your index finger of your other side and you hook it around where the bicep tendon should be from lateral to medial. Okay, so you go on top of the tendon and you should be able to hook the tendon almost like a coat hanger hanging on. And you do that on the good side first, and then you feel the affected side, and you will notice something right away when you don't feel something. Typically, you go, oh, that's, that feels different, and you can't hook it, and the next structure you're feeling is the brachialis, um, which feels completely different than an intact biceps tendon. And so that is the single best, if you have 30 seconds to do a physical exam, do that test. Um, you can look it up very easily, but it is it is a very reliable. It has, I think, 100% sensitivity in, in regards to picking up distal biceps tendon ruptures. Yep. That's great. I love that test. It, it works really, really well. And I, I, you know, I think I've even seen a study where it proved that it was even more effective at identifying a distal tear than an MRI. Um, it, it's got this huge sensitivity and specificity yeah. to it. And it's wonderful. And just, just for those who are listening, um, and, and Dr. Aronowitz said, you're looking at your hand, you're arm is up. So you're abducted, your, your shoulders yep. abducted about 90 degrees, your elbow is at about oh, 60 to 90 degrees. And you're looking at the palm of your hand when you're performing this study, this test. Um, yeah. It works really yeah. well. <clears throat> The other thing I like to look at is I like to obviously resist elbow flexion, but we need to yep. remember that, you know, there are other muscles that flex the elbow. So we can't just use that test alone. I find that resisted supination is a better test, um, you know, to, to identify a weakness issue there. And the other thing that I like to do when somebody has a really large arm, and it's hard to get, you know, a good feel, either proximally or distally. Um, what I will do is I will resist supination and elbow flexion at the same time. And I will grab a hold of the muscle belly and move it side to side. And I'll do it on the other side. And on one side, it'll be nice and solid. On the ruptured side, it will be sloppy and move laterally and medially. It's something that I just mm-hmm. kind of made up myself. And, and I find that that helps, especially with more obese patients. Um, if they're yeah. a little more, you know, uh, mesomorphic, ectomorphic, then we, you know, it's easy to see. It's easy to tell. You yeah. can see the bruising and you can see um, what's going on there. Um, but that's a, a, another way to kind of you know, something else you can throw on top of the package to help with uh, coming to a diagnosis with these patients. No, agreed. After, yeah, t- just a couple of things to add about that, Paul, and that's a great point. But after the hook test, my, I do resisted supination and I start, so elbows at 90 with the palm down. And I ask them to turn their palm up against resistance. Um, and so that's, that's one thing. And then the other, just to very briefly mention a partial tear. So if they have, if you feel the tendon intact on the hook test, but it, it hurts, and you can actually feel, you can palpate the tendon insertion and they have pain and then they have pain with resisted supination. Then I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of a partial tear and, and, and that's obviously a different, a, a different set of pathology than a full tear um, or, a, or a complete distal bicep structure. But that is also something in my differential diagnosis. Yes, yes. And if they have pain with resistance, it's more apt to be a partial. Usually complete ruptures uh, of just about anything seem to be less painful. Um, You know, these massive rotator cuff tears are less painful, large bicep ruptures, quad ruptures are really not that painful when you resist them, they just can't do it. So it becomes more like a almost painless weakness type of issue if they're completely ruptured. So um, great. Those are great points. Um, Now, I'm going to throw two questions into one here. When somebody ruptures their distal biceps versus their proximal biceps, let's talk about the timeline in when you should repair these. It's a young individual. You know that they need their arm to function quite a bit. Um, talk about the timeline. Like It's important that when we recognize them as physical therapists or, or primary care providers, that we don't just kind of sit on these things, I understand. So can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on 
how quickly we should get these over to somebody who specializes in, you know, fixing these things. Right. So uh, these are two completely separate injuries. And so I would tell you that most, most surgeons w do not routinely fix proximal biceps tendon ruptures. And the, the reason is that the degree of the retraction down the arm can be so substantial. I, I, I have seen in second opinions, incisions that go down the whole arm just to find you're finding a shred of a tendon um, that was degenerative anyway. And then you're trying to reapproximate re the tension and because, because you still have the short head intact, um, it, the, the shoulder functions well. So if they can get over that initial discomfort and, and the cosmetic concerns, um, really not many people acutely fix proximal biceps. And I know a lot of times patients are really surprised to hear that. And as therapists and everybody should, should know that, it's just a completely different circumstance than a distal biceps, where again, the tendon is, is one unit. And so it greatly affects function. Um, without surgery, uh, and this has been shown in more than one study, but without surgery in, in a distal biceps, you can expect about 50% supination loss, about 30% flexion loss, and 15% weakness in grip, and loss of endurance. And so, um, you know, most of us, if someone is active and healthy, and they've, rupt you know, they've ruptured their distal biceps, most of us recommend fixing them. And unfortunately, it's a pretty time-sensitive um, surgery, and we know that the results and the complications are the re results are best, and the complications are least when we get to it within three weeks. So I really try to do these within three weeks of the injury. The next, the next timeline would be under six weeks, and once you get out from six weeks, and I, I've been down this road, it gets very scarred in the risk of damage to nerves and um, you know having a, a, a tension, you know, tensioned repair. It really increases dramatically in a short amount of time. So these are the, the injuries where if you have that history or if you happen to see someone in your office with that history with a distal biceps tendon rupture, um, I would get them into an orthopedic surgeon who fixes these as, as quickly as possible. And these are the referrals where I see it and I try, if I'm in the office, I try to see them the same day. If I'm in surgery that day, I see them the next day just to see them and, and try to make plans for repairs as soon as possible. It really makes a tremendous difference. Yeah. And, and to be honest, the, the, all of the distal repairs that I've ever seen have always done very, very well. Um, it seems like there's, there's good fixation and um, they function very well. It's a slow rehab at first and, and we pull them through that. Mm -hmm. But um, ultimately, you know, uh, we have very good success with these. And so is there any reason why you wouldn't do a distal biceps repair on somebody? Right. Well, interestingly, I just had a patient decline, decline surgery and he felt um, a young, young, healthy guy. And he felt that even a few days after the injury, his elbow was functioning at a level that was appropriate for him. You know, I counseled him that that, that might not be the case long term. Um, I think in, in more of an elderly population or if someone has substantial comorbidities, perhaps not fixing it. Um, the, the most common complications can be numbness on the, the lateral aspect of the arm major complications tend to be quite low. And so I, again, this is really one of those injuries that I, um, I, I really do recommend surgery unless there is a, a specific contraindication mainly related to the patient's health or if they really feel that their elbow and the function and the strength is absolutely fine um, and they're willing to accept the risk of missing that window of fixing it because this isn't something that six months later you decide, oh, I, I'd like to have this fixed now. It, it really um, becomes a much more complex situation and the outcomes are not nearly as good as when you fix these right away. Right, right. So we know that, you know, when somebody tears their proximal long head of their bicep, you know, sometimes it's a blessing. Sometimes I kind of, I, I'm mm -hmm. saying to myself in my head, when are you going to rupture that thing? You know, and it, just to get some relief here uh, and they rupture that and they get some relief. Sometimes you, you rupture the distal one and it's obviously an issue you need to take care of. Now, some people, they may get a partial tear. And so, you know, they, they're not like, okay, I need to have surgery right away is this thing going to heal or not? Is there a percentage or size of a tear distally where you would say, you know what, we got to go in and fix this thing. There's only 20% left or, um, you know, you're at 50%. The likelihood of you rupturing this the rest of the way is your thoughts. Yeah. So, so we're, we're talking about distal biceps and yeah. the best way to see that is actually on a, on a special kind of MRI. So on a standard, if you get a standard MRI of the elbow, you're not really going to see the tendon 
um, in, a, in a way in which you need to assess the degree of a partial tear. So we have some special views that we do that allows me uh, and the radiologist to, to really calculate that. Uh, I think 50% is a nice threshold. And um, if it's more than that, I feel very comfortable initially treating this non-operatively. If it's between 25 and 50%, I have a, that discussion with the patient about trying non-surgical non measures first. Um, and it, if it's less than 25% and it really is sort of hanging on by a thread, I, I treat that almost like I do a complete rupture. And, and although the, the urgency might not be there, I do recommend fixing it. With the partial repairs, I do recommend, partial tears, excuse me, I do recommend a trial of non-operative treatment. Um, I think that some of these do get better. If they get better, they, they tend to get better within the first six or eight weeks. If they still have pain that they localize anteriorly, and I'm convinced clinically that it is localized to that distal biceps insertion, I do offer surgery and then I take down the remaining tendon and repair it like I do a primary uh, complete repair. And uh, the results with that are very good. I treat them postoperatively just like I do uh, a complete repair. But I do think that there is a role, um, and again, we're talking about the ones that are, say, hovering around 50%. Um, there is a role of, of non-surgical management. Sure. And while we're talking about post-operative management, um, can you tell me what you like to do post-operatively? Do you have a protocol in regards to immobilization and some sort of progression after you do a distal biceps repair? Right. So I, the way I do my distal biceps, I use an intra, I, I use an intraarticular or um, an extraarticular button that's on the cortex uh, with a very small hole. I do this all through a very small incision through the anterior part of the arm. And I put them in, I put patients in a splint just initially to let the swelling calm down and make sure no one does anything too soon. Um, and then after that, so I mobilize them in 90 degrees for about a week, then they come back to the office and I transition them to a hinged elbow brace. And the two things we're trying to prevent are sudden extension and then supination. And, and the supination a lot of times is really at, at the patient's discretion. They, it's hard to immobilize that. But we're just trying to decrease the activation on the distal biceps for the first few weeks while they're healing. And then every week or so after that, I, I allow more extension. Um, I don't want any resisted elbow flexion or any resisted supination um, really for the first couple of months and then progress from there. And I, I find, unlike cuff repairs, this is an operation that patients really quickly start feeling good and want to start doing things. And I'm holding them back versus our rotator cuff repair patients where even six, eight weeks out, they don't necessarily want to be lifting their arm up overhead and doing things. Um, and so, and I would say by about three or four months, these distal biceps patients are doing very well. And by six months, they've, you know, it's um, almost like a normal, it, it is almost like a normal elbow again. Yeah, I think I think it's very important as far as the the rehab part. When you when you see these patients, that you demonstrate to them, you know what yeah. you should not be doing. The do's and don'ts are very very important. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you can kind of treat off of that by avoiding those activities and working on everything else that becomes a problem, like the proximal stability in the shoulder because that arm's been sitting by their side yes. for such a long time, and doing scapular work, and then getting the fingers and hand, you know, the fingers and hand working a little bit more without stressing that. Biceps. So understanding the anatomy, the function of the biceps, um, and what stresses it, and understanding the uh, selective tissue tension testing, testing that, we, that do, we do, you know, will help you avoid those activities that uh, could cause some problems. Yeah, exactly. And we know the re-rupture rate with these is actually very low. I mean, there, there are studies that show it's, it's around 2%. If it does happen, it tends to happen early within the first three months. And so if we can get patients through that that initial post-operative window, the rate of re-rupture is very, you know, is very low. So that's why I I tend to be, um, well, I don't know if it's more cautious, but I, I, I've had very good success with the post-operative protocol that I've had. Uh, and so I, I plan on sticking with it. There are some people that move patients very early on. Um, I, I think that there's there's certainly a role to, to be said, even just for letting the soft tissues calm down after surgery. Um, and, and everything like that. So I and let the incision heal nicely without moving things too much. So that's why I do a, a little bit of a mobilization for, for a very short amount of time. Yeah, I, I think that the forearm compartment really swells a lot uh, after these injuries and after surgery. And so I agree. I think that you know, getting that yeah. to settle down and getting that elevated um, can, can really help to you know, get that swelling uh, to settle down so you don't end up with any uh, permanent nerve injuries or anything like that. Um, Dr. Ronowitz, is there anything else you want to mention about the biceps? Uh, no, I think, I think this has been great. I think the takeaway is that um, proximal and distal biceps are two completely separate 
conditions and needed to be treated accordingly. And that there's so much variability with the proximal biceps that if you are a therapist, you know, having an idea of whether a tenotomy or a tenodesis was performed, because those are rehabbed differently. I think one advantage of a tenotomy is you're not really protecting anything. Um, and so I tell patients, if they don't mind a bulge, they can actually, you know, that's, that's the least limiting factor in their recovery. And sometimes patients really like that. Whereas if we're doing a tenodesis, we just, we want to protect that part of the, the surgical operation a little bit longer. Um, and so they are different. I mean, I think we've touched on all of that today. Um, and the, the biceps tendon, I think we're appreciating more and more the, the proximal part is, um, can, can be a pain generator. And so it is much more frequent, I think, to do something with the biceps in conjunction with a rotator cuff repair than it is to not do something. And so as therapists and people that are seeing these patients, you'll find that, that it is very common to do both at the same time because um, they're both involved at the same time. And I think if we, if we leave the biceps, um, it can be a pain generator as they're recovering from their repair. If, if, if a patient has a perfectly normal biceps, yes, I leave it. But um, more often than not, there is pathology there and there's pain. Um, and so it's typically addressed at the time of, of, of the repair. Do you ever inject proximal biceps, long head biceps, uh, like with cortisone or anything like that to help decrease inflammation? I, I do. I actually do that quite a bit. We do it under ultrasound guidance and we do it right in the bicipital groove. And I, I do it for two reasons, diagnostic and therapeutic. And so if patients in the absence of any substantial cuff pathology have anterior pain that I think is, is biceps tendonitis, I'll inject them. And the, the, you know, they come back and they say, it worked great for a few weeks, but now my pain is back. And I say, look, that's your biceps. And if they, you know, if they have failed non-operative management otherwise, uh, I take them to surgery and perform a bicep tendon procedure and people do really well with that. Um, best case scenario is it is actually enough to reduce the inflammation that they avoid an operation. Um, and, and that happens quite a bit as well. And so I think that that is a, a nice tool to use. It's very hard to do that without imaging. Um, like an ultrasound. So right. we, we use those modalities and, and it's been very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, awesome. I want to thank you so much again for, uh, for being on the show with us. Uh, your, your information that you give us is always uh, incredible and uh, very useful for especially therapists and, and primary care providers. And uh, so uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to, uh, to help us out. No, my pleasure, Paul. Thank you again. It's always great uh, having these conversations with you. And to all our listeners, thank you so much for being there, for listening and uh, sticking with us through these uh, uneasy times with this COVID virus. Um, it, it's been tough for everybody. It's affected everybody. Uh, it's a great time to, you know, if, if you've got some time on your hands, it's a great time to do things that you haven't had a chance to do before. Um, and it's a great time to learn. So uh, listening to podcasts and watching uh, some of our YouTube content uh, can be very helpful. Please uh, get in touch with us if you have any questions. If you have any questions for Dr. Aronowitz, you can run them through me. My uh, information will be in the show notes along with all of the other uh, information, all of the other links that we have associated with Ortho Eval Pal. And um, if you happen to get over to our YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe, hit the notification bell so you get videos as they come out and uh, give us a thumbs up if you uh, like our videos. And I would love it if you could um, hop over to Apple Podcasts or any other station that holds uh, podcasting and uh, give us a rating and review. It really helps with our reviews amongst other um, podcasters out there. So again, folks, thank you so much and please stay safe.